applause, please, as we welcome to the stage. All right, let's get cracking. Let's grow our business on LinkedIn. I've been in the online marketing business since I was 17. I was doing search engine optimization back in those days. Lived in Asia for a while, Southeast Asia, marketing real estate. One thing I've learned throughout my career is with marketing, if you want to be at the top of the game, you've got to be ready to adapt quicker than anyone else. Because who would agree things are changing faster than they ever have before? Sometimes when I meet guys that have come to my training, people say, oh, Nat, I did your training two years ago. I know everything about LinkedIn. So if you did my training two years ago, 60% of what you're doing is wrong. That's how quick things are changing. When the old pandemic came along, I went from thinking that social media is a cool thing to grow your business that works really well to you like must be on there if you're in business. The digital adoption, no matter what industry you're in, has, has doubled during the pandemic and it's become essential for businesses to survive, to be able to adapt. And this is the way, as Brooke said, to have conversations at scale. Who feels a bit like my friend Marshall when they're on social media? <laughs> Don't forget to follow me on Snapchat, hashtag me on Instagram, tag me on LinkedIn, and while you're at it, subscribe to my newsletter and come on Facebook and like me there as well. Have you ever seen a post like that? <laughs> I'm exaggerating. But it's fair to say a lot of people are on there and because it's free, they're kind of just throwing spaghetti at the wall on all these different platforms. But it's, it's such an unstrategic method. And so what I'm going to talk about today is being strategic. Because it's not just about getting results on social media, it's actually about managing your time most efficiently as well. So you want the most effective results in the most efficient time possible. The drama is, right, I should probably take Marshall off the... <laughs> Bless him. That's, yeah, Marshall the King Charles Cav. He, he doesn't like LinkedIn at all. He hears about it all day long. I was, I was reading this article, right? They said, if you have trouble falling asleep at night, when you go to bed, don't look at your phone, don't do work, don't watch movies, don't, don't, don't do anything in your bed other than sleep, and a couple of other things. <laughs> and I thought, it's interesting. It's very much like what's happening on social media, because... We do use it for our personal lives. When I log on to Instagram, especially, um, not so much on, on LinkedIn, I'm consuming content. Like, I'm scrolling, my friends are there, I'm watching stories. So when I hop on, I've got to be extremely disciplined if I'm going to use it for work, because I get distracted. We have to kind of decide, are we on social media to consume it and to socialize, or, or are we using it to grow our business? Because if we're using it to grow our business, we have to be strategic about it. Before Brooke was pregnant, she used to spend her um, time on the treadmill every morning doing her stories and responding to comments. For the, up to two hours, she responds to comments every single day. So unless she was strategic and disciplined about it, she wouldn't be able to have the results that she's, she's had. Like, it is a job. It's a fun job, but it's still a job. It's got to be the same on LinkedIn. There's a lot of people consuming stuff on LinkedIn, especially when they're on their phone. And the mobile um, usage of social media, we forget a lot of the time as business owners because we, we do a lot of the stuff on LinkedIn on our computers, but the people that are consuming it generally are on their phone. It's like about 70% of the people that are uh, using LinkedIn are on their telephone. We are way more on Instagram, obviously. So LinkedIn, it's no biggie. <laughs> hey, he's funny too. All right. Social media is a way for us to converse with our audience at scale. So if it's not working for you, it's not, it's not to do with the platform. I don't actually believe that organic reach is dead on any platform. I've heard it over and over again. Organic reach is dead on Facebook. Organic reach is dead on Twitter. Yet there still, still seems to be people crushing it without paying for ads. I would suspect that the chances are that it's just not working for the individual that's using it because the algorithm's got smarter, so it's serving its users better content, so you've just got to be better. If anyone's got an ego, and we all do, <laughs> it's much easier to blame the platform than to actually look at what you're doing and go, okay, I, what I'm doing is shit, <laughs> it's not working, in order to get results. People interact with things that resonate with them on a personal level. So even though it's a business platform, you can know all the things about business, about venture capital or like the oil and gas industry, but if you start posting about that, the way that you would write about it in like a white paper or whatever, it was just going to be boring, and it's, they're not going to resonate with anyone on a personal level. It's still a social media site. A lot of people who jump onto LinkedIn that aren't familiar with using it, they either go one or the other. They're like too casual and too personal, or far at the other end, too businessy. And I think that's probably worse. 
to be honest, because at least then you, people can resonate with you on a personal level. Knowing your target audience becomes extremely important because how can you, how can you engage people? How are you going to get people to give you a like or a comment, follow you or buy from you, which is all, all valuable. All those things are them investing in you. If you're not targeting somebody specific, how are you going to be able to add enough value for them to bother spending their time watching your content? You've got to be really targeted. I was in digital marketing for a long time before I niched down on LinkedIn. But when I niched down on LinkedIn, the results went through the roof, offline and online. Because all of a sudden, when LinkedIn comes up in a conversation, I get the call. But I wouldn't get the call if I did LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, websites. So niching becomes really important on social media. Because in the old days, we would just expand our reach to get more customers. You've got to do the opposite now. So the reason that most businesses fail on social media is just a natural human instinct. Like, I worked really hard, and I, I imagine Brooke would be the same, to, to not do these things. I have to remind myself constantly to not be impatient, because we all want results yesterday. That's why the best headlines for any blog post is the three ways to double your revenue overnight, or, you know, we want, we want to make money, like, now. We want this quick solution, the one secret that was going to transform your business. The four-hour work week. All that stuff is just to get you to buy their bloody book. That doesn't exist. I don't believe, maybe a limiting belief, but I believe the four-hour work week exists. And this is the other reason, is, is, is we are selfish. Social media is not about you. And, it, and when I explain this to businesses, I get these very puzzled looks. I go, no, 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 you don't understand, Nathaniel. No, we're on there for us. We want a strategy that serves us. And I understand that, but, but that's the, in the macro, you want to grow your business. But the way that you grow your business is you add more value to your customer than anyone else. If you do that, you win. But on social media, you've got to do it even more so. Because like, think about it, when you're in front of somebody versus when you're on a computer chatting to somebody that you haven't met, when you're on the computer, do you have less empathy or more, more empathy? Or is it the same? It's less, isn't it? Do you care about the other person? More or less? Le less. Do you have a connection? More or less? It's less. And so all of these, these business owners, which are really nice people, would be really nice to you if they met you at a cocktail party. All of a sudden, when they get on the computer, they just lose all their social skills. <laughs> they don't reply to people. Like people comment on their stuff, and they're like, oh, there's only three people. Imagine if you went to a, a cocktail party, and you like, wanted to network at this party, right? And you get there, and there's only 10 people there. Would you spend your time conversing with the 10 people, asking them questions, being personal with them, getting to know them, seeing who is in the room? Or would you be out of the front of the venue trying to get more people to come in? Because that's what a lot of businesses that are on social media are doing. They're like, I've only got 100 followers, and they're spending all their time trying to get new ones and completely forget about who's following them in the first place. 100 followers is actually quite a lot. Like, it's enough. If they're really engaged, and they really care about your content, and they expect it, and you're consistent, you can grow a business. And that, that'll just, you'll just uh, grow the number of followers as well. But you just got to be careful about why you're measuring certain metrics. I, don't, I think, yes, number of followers is something that you measure. But why are you measuring it? I think return on investment is something that you measure as well. But what's the purpose behind it? Because you could quite easily focus on the number of followers, and you'd spend all your time on social media, and, you, and your revenue would go through the floor. Yeah. Yep, that's true. Yep. That's right, yeah, you don't. All, all, you, all you can do is just look at your own numbers. And because there's a lot of people that get on social media and they get lots of followers and lots of engagement and they can't pay their rent. I, think, I feel like it's the ultimate failure because it's kind of, they're doing all right, they look good, but it's, they know that it's not really working for them. And so they, quite often they don't identify the problem. And so they just keep doing what they're doing because they want to look good. If you care about looking good more than you care about actually being good, you, those will always conflict. And there's a lot of that on social media, a huge amount of that. So this is what's happening in the world at the moment. People have more choices and less time. And so what's happening is people's attention span on social media are getting shorter. And so what most marketers do, and what you probably like read in all these blogs and stuff that's telling you all these quick hacks, is you've got to make your video shorter. You've got to put more subtitles in them. You've got to make them grab people's attention. But the problem is, there's no point grabbing attention just for the sake of it. And there's different kinds of attention as well. So like somebody that's been to one of these seminars and heard Brooke and I speak for a couple of hours, that follow is going to be worth a lot more to me than someone I capture with a three second video. So you've got to look at the quality of the attention that you're getting if you want to grow your business. What I'm talking about is being 
focused with your marketing? Because if you're unfocused, and there's still a portion of the time that I spend on social media that is unfocused, but I have the focus component as well, which allows you to say no to things. It allows you to be way more proactive with what you're doing. Who posts their, when they post on social media, and be honest, who thinks of their post on the day that they post it? Okay, cool. And who's planning their content by, like a month in advance? Awesome. Well done, all the social club members. <laughs> if you're trying to add value to a consistent target market and you want to be consistent and you want to be posting on the op most optimal times and the most optimal days, it's unfair not on your audience not to plan it. Because if you're not planning it, you're, you are going back to being selfish and doing what you want to post. And it might change from week to week, and that's where this inconsistency comes into it. The mere exposure effect... Has anybody heard of the mere exposure effect before? Awesome. Mere exposure effect is a psychological phenomenon that says the more times that a customer or a or person is exposed to your brand, the more likely they are to like you and trust you and do business with you. So, it, like, let's say 15 years ago, five exposures, you, you drove home, you saw five billboards of Coca-Cola on the way home, you didn't see any Pepsi ones, you're more likely to buy Coca-Cola because it's more familiar. These days, you would need to see a lot more exposures. You need to see 30 exposures plus. And so I think of social media like, how do I get 30 exposures in front of my target audience so they like me more, trust me more, and want to do business with me more than the next guy? And if you nail it, there's no competition, which is, which is really interesting to me because I didn't expect that when I went into content marketing and social media at all. Like LinkedIn, if any of you were on it nine, eight years ago, there was, you couldn't post content. Couldn't post content at all. It was a recruitment website that people would use to find talent, hire people. And so I used to use it just to message people. I was like, I want to do business with the CEO of this company, and, you know, this guy and this guy, and I would message them and set appointments. It was working extremely well, because like, no one's used to getting LinkedIn messages unless they're getting offered a job. And there's all these salespeople and marketers jump on it, onto LinkedIn, and LinkedIn go, oh, we forgot about these guys. These guys will want to use the platform too. And so they create all these sales and marketing products, and then they start following all the other social media channels, allowing content to be posted. You write articles to start with. When video came into the platform, it completely changed. So every single year since video has come out, the uh, session time, the amount of time that each member spends on LinkedIn has gone up by at least 30% every single year. So not only is it growing at two members every single second, but those members are spending 30% more time on the platform. They're way more engaged on the platform. They're spending more and more time. And as LinkedIn's algorithm gets better, serves its users content that they're going to be interested in, people will just spend more time on there. And so there's a real captive audience. So like if, you're in, if you're in any business that targets other businesses, B2B, it's very straightforward how to, you know, who your target market is. If you target accountancy accountants pra practices or you target psychologists or you target schools, you can find the key decision makers within those organizations really easily on LinkedIn. But if you're in B2C or a product-based business, and I know a few of you are, then you could be thinking about, okay, distribution channels, suppliers, getting contracts with suppliers, business partners, people that share the same target audience as, you, as your business has. You can find them on, on LinkedIn. Like I know um, Brooke's not a big user of <laughs> LinkedIn, but when she is using it, it's, it's for like media opportunities and uh, podcasts and stuff like that. The event organizers actually use LinkedIn to find speakers. So like, if you are a speaker, put it in your headline. Very similar to Instagram, like the headline is the most important part from a keyword perspective when people are searching. The word of caution, though, because 10 years ago, I was saying jam all these keywords into your headline and you'll show up in the top of search results, and you, and you would. But now everyone's doing it. And so it can make your profile look a bit try hard. <laughs> so you've got to think about your target audience, right? Because if your target audience is you know, large companies, uh, C-suite executives, and you, you're contacting them and you've got all these rose emojis and keywords stuffed into your headline, they're not going to take you very seriously. I always say, look at the target market that you have on LinkedIn and mirror a lot of what they have in their profile. If they're a CEO of an ASX-listed company, they might just say, CEO, Blackstone Minerals or something, right? And so you want to have CEO, BB Consulting. So they feel like you're on the same level with them if you're prospecting on LinkedIn. So customer journey, 
when I talk about messaging people, we're really pretty much just like getting appointments straight away. That's like a bottom of the funnel lead generation. Content marketing is, is something in which I did for, I think I was doing video for about four years when no one was watching them, mainly on YouTube. And all my friends would say, mum is here, would say, what are you doing all those videos for? No one's watching them. And I, did, I was like, I don't really know what to say. You know, no one was watching them. <laughs> but then, <laughs> my mum was, yeah, I get like two views. She watched it twice. <laughs> Thanks, mum. She's the best. But eventually, like I... You would learn what works, and this is what I talk about, like throwing more things and spaghetti against the, spaghetti against the wall so you get more feedback because that's how you learn social media. It's not through, you know, you can't really let, go to a course to learn what your audience wants. You have to find it out from them. And I work with, work with like large companies with hundreds of people in their marketing department, and when I ask them how they come up with their social media strategy, they say something along the lines of, well, we get the director of this division, this division, this division, and we all meet in the conference room, and we get the whiteboard out, and we you know, identify who our target market is. They don't, they don't include their customer when they're planning their social... Their customers should be the ones planning their social media strategy. They should be asking them what they want to, what they want to hear about. And what's going to add value to them? You see most of these guys that are getting, like these big companies are slow to catch on their social media. There's not many that are, that are nailing it on LinkedIn at least. <clears throat> so in terms of like trust, when I talked about the value of attention, this is the tr digital trust index, okay? So this gives you a rough idea of how uh, much people trust content on different platforms. So like if you see, you know, a post on Facebook, how likely is it that somebody's going to trust the content if they don't know you from a bar of soap? Well, it's about half or less than half that of, of, um, of LinkedIn. Still stumbled over my words there. And Instagram, well. <laughs> okay, obviously there's things that come into this as to, like, you know, if, you're, if they've got a relationship with you and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just saying, like, over, overall, people think that LinkedIn-related content is true, more true, right? So the value of the attention is quite high if you're in the right type of business. So I always talk about adding value to your customer because um, if you do the 20 exposures in front of a, your target audience and you're just selling to them every single time, call to action, you're just going to piss them off. You're going to build negative brand sentiment. It'll work against you. So it's really important that all your content adds value. And people ask me, well, Nathaniel, how do I add value? So this is how you do it. So there's inspiration. So this is, <laughs> so like, this is something that I would never, ever post on social media normally. Right? Because I've got 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Right? If I saw someone post that, I'd think, what a wanker. Right? <laughs> but... These posts get me more leads than any other kind of post that I do. And I've only just recently started experimenting with them. Anything to do with milestones, achievement, doesn't have to be you. You could, you could talk about your customers achieving stuff. You can make more of a big thing about it than they do. Right? Is, is Kim in the room? I've seen you post. There you are. How, uh, when we did that um, content recording, and we did that post about it, we had like 6,000 views. Like, yeah, first video on LinkedIn, here we are recording it. Yeah, 6,000 views on LinkedIn just from a photograph. So there's this kind of content that people want to, they actually want to support you because the one thing they all have in common if they're in your network is they know you. So if it's about you like, making progress and then what happens is momentum attracts customers. So like if you have if you have like 30 things happen in your business at once what I suggest you do is not tell everyone about all of them is I would tell I would tell them about one thing every single month <laughs> and your social media will just go bananas but just keep an eye on it because even like your birthday of your business right this is something I would never talk about I didn't even know what it when it was now it's in my calendar because I know to do a post about it because it's inspirational <clears throat> education is a big one on LinkedIn so educating target audience with stuff that they might be interested in. Obviously, it's really easy for me. They're all on LinkedIn, so talk about LinkedIn. But if your followers you know, appreciate education, especially if you're in the education business, if you're in, when I started with LinkedIn, all the marketing I had to do was education because no one knew what I was talking about. No one knew what LinkedIn was. No one had ever tried LinkedIn marketing. 
So it was all education. I educate them about it, and then they're interested, and then they buy. <clears throat> You'll notice as well, as I go through these, how I've structured the wording. So this is how long a paragraph should be, one sentence. Because you remember people are watching on a, reading on a mobile device, you've got to make it really easy for them to read. So you can short sentences, one sentence per paragraph, so they don't lose their spot. Because as soon as they lose their spot, they're out of there. On a video, and videos, by the way, are shared 20 times more than any other post on LinkedIn. So if you want to know what kind of content to put up, if you can, do video. Um, one thing I will say, because I know there's a lot of people that use Instagram here, uh, on... Um, <laughs> The, the, the question about whether you, you just do it on your mobile as opposed to professional is something that you need to think about from your target audience's perspective. Because like if, when I was doing business with guys like Apple or you know, um, some of the banks or some of the, some of the companies I wanted was clients were international companies, right? And so anyone that they're comparing me against is using professional video. So I had to deliver at that level. The, the challenge becomes with social media, if you're doing it at a professional level and you're hiring, hiring videographers, is if you search on Google, and I would have spoken to no, no less than 50 video marketing companies in Australia over the years easily. The cheapest video I could find was $5,000 for a two-minute video on Google. I, I got it. it was my, it's our um, what we do video. Because they're so used to like, creating this like, one video that serves one purpose and you send it to everyone, but the problem is, with social media, we need so much content to be constantly putting it in front of our buyer that if it was five grand every time you did a video, it just wouldn't be sustainable, you know? Maybe it might be all right for some large companies, but, you know, it certainly wasn't all right for me. And so I went on Airtasker. Cheapest videographer I could find on Airtasker, 500 bucks. No experience, no other clients, <laughs> right? <laughs> I hired him, <laughs> right? I hired him. And I, we worked it out together, you know? <laughs> and he, I was like filming my content to the camera and he's like, oh, Nathaniel, it's not that good. <laughs> I was like, watching it back and I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I said, um, I said here, why don't we do this? Why don't you interview me? He's like, I don't know what to ask you. I said, well, here, give me a pen. And I wrote down five questions. I said, boom, ask me them. And it looked a lot better, which is interesting. And is no, it's not because I... <laughs> This, this dude, I'm not going to get in there. So then I said, why don't we go and interview other entrepreneurs? I'll call it LinkedIn Heroes. And that way, like, I don't have to be thinking up all the content and stuff. And he came with me. And after uh, following me around to interviews, like maybe once a week for about, I don't know, four or five months or something like that, me interviewing different entrepreneurs, he was fully booked and hired two people to work for him. Because every person I interviewed hired him to, to work with him. So... <laughs> But still, 500 bucks is a lot of money for one video, right? And so I'll constantly be thinking, how do I create a higher volume of content that's awesome, that's good value, that doesn't look like you're, you know, because you have to learn these skills. Like sitting in front of a camera talking is a bit, like, it's a bit nerve-wracking if you haven't done it before. Just professional people on TV and stuff go through like a whole university degree. Does anyone study PR or in media or anything like that? Even the, the amount of training that they do just to get their vocal tonality right is huge. So for somebody that hasn't done it before, it's quite intimidating. And so one of the things I'm most proud of, and it's taken me years to develop, is the, our, our program called Behind the Brand, where we're interviewing business owners, and they spend an hour there answering questions. The questions that I ask them are like designed to create engaging content. And so every answer is like a two-minute video. So we can create 50 bits of content for a client with just taking one hour of their time. I go there with the video guys, I interview them, I ask them the questions that I know creates engaging content, we chop it all up, 50 videos, 20 images, and they've got enough content to post for four, four months. I got, got the idea from Gary Vee. Does anyone know who Gary Vee is? Gary Vee, ladies and gentlemen. Legend on social media. Guess how many times he posts a day? 100. And, and it, yeah, he's got a whole team, yeah, that's right, yeah. But somebody that's getting that much feedback, going back to what I was saying before about the amount of feedback you get, knows a thing or two about how to create high quality content in a high volume. And so he, he put this deck out called the content model, or the, something like that, uh, the slide deck. And um, he showed how he creates his content. So what he does is like, if he does a talk or something like this, 
the uh, video team film it, and then they chop it all up into 100 pieces of content, 50 bits of content. They label each video, and then he's got these social media posts to post for ages. Obviously, he's doing a lot of these keynotes, interviews, stuff like that. And I was thinking, yeah, well, we're, my clients and, and me, we don't need to post 100 times a day, but it'd be good to get 100 pieces of content from just one hour, wouldn't it? And so I used the same system um, to develop content for my clients. And I, like, you can do it yourselves, but you've got to know what's engaging. So it, the way that I've learned what the engaging content is, is when you post those 50 videos, is then you look at all of them after you've posted them and see w what the comments say, how many comments there were. And then if you find like one topic, you've got way more comments than the other ones, and you will. There'll be things that resonate with people a lot more than the other stuff, like the questions that you ask, sorry, the answers that you give. And then you, and then you, you, you make the next hour all about that topic. And so every time you do another batch of content, we call it batch creation, you're optimizing. You're going like harder into whatever your audience is interested in. So I don't know if anyone watched Gary V stuff when he started, but he was just talking about business. Now he talks about caring what other people think, uh, <laughs> relationships, parenting. Like was, uh, and Cohen Ray did this as well. Like they shifted their content based on the audience's insights. And I think that's why they're so successful. They're getting, they're getting more feedback. They're getting feedback quicker than anyone else, and they're adjusting to the audience's insights rather than just what they want to talk about. Information. So you, have you ever heard of newsjacking? Anybody heard of newsjacking? So like, this is quite possible to do in an industry that you're constantly in, is you find out some news that's going on in the, in the industry, and then you share it with your network, so your network hears about it first, because the chances are, if they're not in your space, they may not hear about it right away. Who, who's um, heard about Instagram updates directly from following Brooke or the Social Club community? Right? It's time, as, soon, as soon as there's no likes on Instagram, like I saw it on the news, so I go straight onto Instagram, there's the update from Social Club telling me what's happening. And LinkedIn introduced stories, so I you know, did the same sort of thing. And this, this um, I th there was a video and an article. So again, you know, if you're creating a video, make it an article as well. You, know, put the, you can get it transcribed on rev.com for a dollar a minute, R-E-V. Write that one down. That's a good tip for you. Rev's awesome. Transcription service. Um, this was quoted in a f not, nothing, uh, nothing huge, but like some online news websites. This uh, article was referenced because there wasn't much on, on the internet yet. Yes. From Instagram to LinkedIn. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, there's there's a lot of value in it. I think what I do when I'm doing that, because I do, I do do that a lot, is I just quickly just put picture myself in my customer's shoes, and the context of why they're on the platform, and I might change a few words, take out a few hashtags, take out a few emojis. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. As a general rule, like stay away from them. I think it's okay when you're. Um, yeah. Like if, you, if, you, if you've seen the profiles with the emojis in their headline, like don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> it just makes you. Look, it, it. Well, it depends who your target audience is, but it does make you look cheap. Like. Remember that profile photo I sent you the other day? This guy's got like, like light beams coming out from behind his head and he's got like no neck and, you know. Oh, was it? Oh, well, it was in that case. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll keep cracking. So entertainment, by the way, this is the biggest opportunity on LinkedIn at the moment because there's not many people doing entertainment at all. Entertaining posts. Like if you're funny, LinkedIn's your platform. I've been talking about this for a while now. This post went bananas. What does it say? 283 reactions, 107 comments. I don't, I don't know what that equates to in views, but it must have been around 20,000. Check Hello. it out. My name is Brian Mills. I've scoured LinkedIn to find the one candidate whose particular set of skills are worthy of my team. I found him. And his name is Casey Wiggins. Casey Wiggins. Casey Wiggins. Casey is a PC tech you can trust with your life or your daughter. His skills in information security are extremely valuable. Skills like vulnerability assessment, network security, and computer forensics. 
Because without their skills, your data will be taken. His previous experience makes him a valuable asset in any crowd control scenario. That job is more chaotic than an Albanian whorehouse and twice as dangerous. Plus, he can cook a steak. I cannot stress how valuable this is to any team. With a degree in information security intelligence, I may have need for Casey for my next mission, unless you hire him first. Now understand, I don't make recommendations for just anyone, but Casey's profile has more stopping power than a fist to the throat. If you want to protect your family... Dad? Let's go, Kim. Connect with me, Brian Mills. But if you want to protect your data, connect with Casey Wiggins. I strongly recommend you follow my instructions to the letter. And if you think you can find a more qualified candidate, good luck. <laughs> no worries. No, it's real, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, good question. So there's two... Oh, so the, he, this was a, a, a post that I'm sharing because it was entertaining. It got a lot of attention. Yeah, like he's he's not going to be getting job opportunities left, right and centre from that, that content. He needs to do more than that. There's two sides to social media marketing. It's getting attention and then there's building trust. You can't really make it work with just one or the other. Because what will happen is, if you're really good at getting attention, you'll see the accounts like this on social media all the time. They get attention, but then they break the trust, and so they lose the attention. So they constantly need to get new people in, and so they never really grow their audience. So if you get attention in, and you build trust, it doesn't go away. And so that's how you grow a following. It's really important that, you know, if you're going to post something entertaining, you, like, that's not enough. You also have also got to give value. Yes. Um, again, I'm just going to, like, the way that I think about that when you ask me that question is I just think about who's my audience? What mind frame are they in when they're on Instagram? What mind frame are they in on LinkedIn? Um, it's just different. It's just different. And it will evolve. Like, uh, t LinkedIn will get stories right eventually. They will. They've, they've got them on there. They've, they've got, so the top left of Instagram, right, where you get your stories, is to view people's stories. On LinkedIn, they've made it to add a story. It's a big mistake. They'll work it out eventually. But they need people to consume the content for people to post on there, not the other way around. So <laughs> this profile, right, <laughs> it has got, has got some keywords in the headline. Um, I think that if you're... On LinkedIn, social proof is really important. So when people come to your profile, is it just you telling them why you're so great at what you do? Or is, it, is there other people doing it as well? So one of the easiest ways to do it is through recommendations. You can get testimonials on LinkedIn. Most people don't bother. They don't, because you have to get them authentically. Like people have to go to your profile, press recommend. Easiest way to get recommendations? Ask for them and give them. There's a, there's a word I can't pronounce. It goes a little bit like this. Reciprocity. <laughs> Reciprocity. <laughs> that, that's really big on social media. So if you don't know what to post, go and like and comment on a whole bunch of people in your target audience. I had a client that was in the mining business and had never used social media before. He had 50 uh, connections on LinkedIn. And he came to one of my events, and he's like, oh, wow, social media, this is amazing. He had a meeting with me the next day, and he's like, we'll do everything. And I was like, okay, wow, we're starting from scratch. But like generating leads, creating the content with the interview process I talked about, and then posting for him. And so we're slowly like growing his connections. He's gone from like 50 to like 150 to 200, and then the content's ready, so we start posting that. And like people are engaging, like he's getting engagement, and he's getting uh, people that haven't heard from him in a few years, call him up and saying, oh, we've seen your videos, you know, it's great to see that you're doing this, this and this. 
And I logged in one day to have a look at his campaign, see how it was performing. And I looked in the news feed because he targets CEOs of like mining companies and ASX listed businesses. But because he only had 500 connections when he started, like his news feed was just full of all these high profile guys, like CEOs of these mining companies. Because he, he, never, he, he was never reactive on the platform. You know, so most people, when they hop on LinkedIn, they just go, oh, look, some eight people have sent me a connection request. And so they'll accept them to grow their followers. But those eight people aren't in their target audience. They're salespeople and recruiters. And so th then they'll say, LinkedIn's rubbish. It's full of salespeople and recruiters. And people sending me rose emojis, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's because they've been reactive. They, like, you know, who's going to send you a connection request? A lot of salespeople will do, and a lot of recruiters will do, because they're trying to, to find people. And so if, if you're proactive right from the start, going back to the example of my friend, like 50, he had, he had 50 connections, they were probably people he knew. Your newsfeed is so targeted, and most of the CEOs of these mining companies are only getting like three or four comments every time they post. And so I said to him, I said, mate, you go in there once a week for an hour, and he goes, you comment on all of them. He goes, they'll all, uh, they'll all like you more, They'll all trust you more, and when you reach out to them, they'll want to talk to you. Because there's, there's, there's a lot of brain science to social media. When you like somebody's post and comment on it who only has three comments, dopamine gets released in their brain. They're already becoming addicted to you. It's, this, is, this, is, this is why social media is so effective. It's to do with brain science. Whereas if you give somebody a call to action who hasn't asked for it, has no interest in your product, they're going to release cortisol, stress hormone. Because when the people are on LinkedIn especially, but on social media as well, they're just always look, like, looking. When they, anyone approaches them, they're like, is this person trying to take something from me or are they trying to give me something? And so you should be very careful, no matter how good your intentions are, to not look like a salesperson. People don't like salespeople. They've got a really bad rap at the moment. So on LinkedIn, so like you've got to make sure that you don't have sales professional in your headline and things like that. You've got to find out if people have the problem that you solve before you start offering a solution. Otherwise, you're going to come across as a salesperson, and it won't work. Okay, so just I'm going to give you a big content hack here. This is this is the content that gets the most engagement. If you're not getting engagement on your content, I'm willing to bet that it's probably of this reason I'm about to share with you in a minute. But these are the top shared videos, right? The single biggest reasons why startups succeed. Why the best hire might not have the perfect resume. Why do so many failed musicians win in business? And the list goes on. One th what's the one thing that all of those headlines have in common? Gay son in the 1950s is on there. <laughs> Extra gum, the story of C Sarah and Yuan. The most powerful thing that you can discover with content marketing, and I've only really grasped, like fully grasped and understand this now, is curiosity and intrigue. So if you want people to pay attention, you've got to build curiosity with your content. Don't tell them everything. Because if you tell them everything, they're not going to want to know more. You've got to be able to intrigue with your content. But some of these things, like Extra Gum, the story of Sarah and Yuan, 57,800 shares. You've got no idea. What, what's that about? But it creates curiosity because it shows up in the news feed. It probably got a compelling image. With the video content, <laughs> I tell us, you probably um, haven't heard this story, so I'll share it. But when I started doing my video, going back to like two or three years with no one watching them, I was like, I had this idea. I was like, I'll get a really wicked intro video, right? I've seen these like, intro videos. And so I'm in St. Kilda, and like, I've got my sunglasses on. There's these aerial shots of like Melbourne. It was a high impact with the hip-hop music on. And I watched it, and I was like, this is it. Right, it's over. <laughs> awesome. So I started putting it at the front of every video. And I look at the analytics on YouTube, and it's like people are watching the little intro. The, the music video comes on, bang. All my view lose all my viewers, right? And so I thought it was cool, but my audience didn't care. So I, I was saying to Brooke the other night, I, I sit at home some nights on a, sometimes on a Friday night with a glass of wine and watch it myself, and I'm like, yeah. yeah. But no one else gives a shit. Right? You've got to see it. Yeah, it's cool. So... 
on average, if somebody's watching your video, if, after 10 seconds, 50% of them have stopped watching on average. Most content's crap, so like, you know, you'll do better than that. But after a minute, it's more than 80% of the peop people are gone. So you've got to be careful, like, is your preamble too long? You know, getting straight into it. But the way that actually keep people watching it, right, you want to get straight to the value that you're going to provide. You want to tell people what the value is, but curiosity and intrigue will keep people watching it. Have you ever watched like a TV series or a Netflix series and you get to like season three and you're like, this is not as good as it was, but you keep watching because you need to know how it ends. Brooke watches Home and Away for God's sake. Because <laughs> you're, you're invested in it, you want to know what happens, what happens next. And that, that's how the, the YouTube creators get, um, go bananas. It's because on YouTube, like, it's to do with retention, how long people watch your videos for. And they're just exceptionally, exceptionally good at um, curating curiosity. So it's like, okay, in this video, I'm going to tell you the three ways to generate leads on LinkedIn. Like you're telling them what they're going to get, but you don't tell them what they are until later on in the video. And they'll keep watching it because they want to find out. The great thing about video is you can edit out all the, the rubbish and crap. Like a lot of the times when I see people do their first video, it's like the first thumbnail is like of two empty chairs because they haven't ran around and sat down yet. Like, and then they're like, then they go, oh, this is our first video. We were thinking about doing a video. Now we're doing a video. What's your name? My name's this. Then, like I say to them, cut all that shit out <laughs> and get straight to the... Sometimes in the interviews, I even cut the question out. I just want to hear the answer. Yeah, they do. They do it in the car as well, like on the way to work. Like, oh, just on my way to work, thought I'd do a video, quick, quick video. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> and yeah, and like 80% of people on LinkedIn are watching stuff at work, so that they don't have a sound on. So if you don't have subtitles, like they'll watch it because they're bored out of their brain and they're at work, but they don't know what you're saying if you don't have subtitles. So rev.com. Scroll stopping content. Curiosity. I'm all big on this at the moment. Okay, so when you do your posts, a great way to hook people in the first sentence is to use one of these phrases. Because what will happen is people will see the first two sentences in your caption, first two sentences of your post, and then they'll have to click read more to see the rest of it. And so that's where you want to create intrigue and curiosity. Because if they click read more, then they're more likely to read the rest of it, they're more likely to play your video. Not everyone that reads your caption is going to play your video. They'll see your caption before they see the video, so the caption's got to be good. You can't just post a video with no caption. What's the video about? You've got to explain that in the caption. Most people, like, they don't, they don't write sentences that are three words long. They jam in everything, especially in business. They think they have to cover every single, like, thing because they might make a mistake. You, you don't need to. Take a photo of that if you haven't already. If you start posts like, like this, it creates intrigue. Like, um, what was uh, my business when I started it? I was, I was broke and I'd lost my job and my electricity got cut out all within pretty much just 24 hours. And that's when I decided to start my company. But if I started the post explaining everything I just said, it's just too much information. Like if I started it with like, I remember the day I lost my job, that's it. And then it, people have to read the next sentence, which is a, a paragraph in itself. It keeps people entertained and it keeps people engaged, more importantly. When they click read more, it's, it's actually just as valuable like a like and a comment is. It's still engagement, people clicking. There's a thing called dwell time on LinkedIn. I don't know if Instagram has this, but, sorry? Yeah. That's right. So if you got a, if you write an article and people looking at it for a long time, LinkedIn knows that it's valuable content because what it doesn't want to happen is you to get a group of other content creators together. You've got 10 of you in a club and you're like, okay, guys, we're going to kill it on social media. You like my stuff and I like your stuff and we'll just do that all day long and comment on each other's stuff so we'll be really popular. The algorithm will push us out to loads of people. LinkedIn saw that going on and they're like, whoa, that's, that's going to put a lot of crap content in front of people. We don't want that. That'll, that will lose customers. So they did the same thing with Insta, right? Yeah, I mean, Insta probably did it earlier. LinkedIn's normally lagging in this area. But so 
like if people are going there, liking, leaving, liking, leaving, LinkedIn knows that they're not that interested in your content, so they've got to be engaged. And that's why the longer the article is, on the basis it's valuable, that it will do better. Because it's more value, people are spending more time there. So these algorithms are just getting smarter. Like at the end of the day, at the end of link, like LinkedIn and Instagram's all their product development teams work, they'll give the user exactly what they want. And so if you want to win in the long term, just think, think about giving a user exactly what you want. All these hacks like engagement pods on Google, like getting backlinks from hundreds of websites and stuff. I used to do it at the start of my career. I killed it. I got offered a, a job in, in Hong Kong because I knew how to get websites at the top of Google. Google updates its algorithm. Phew, I can't do that anymore. I'll get you blacklisted off Google is what I'll do if I do that. And so like, this is what I'm saying is in terms of being able to adapt, the only way that you can win long-term at social media is you align your objective with the objective of the platform. And the platform doesn't want to give its users shit content. They don't want to trick their users. They want to give them value. So that, that's ultimately why the people that were getting like, loads of followers on Instagram and, and LinkedIn are now saying the organic reach has dropped because maybe their content wasn't as good as they thought it was. The algorithms got smarter, and now they're not getting as much attention, and they want to blame the platform. It's probably just that the platform's not as good as they thought it was. Uh, sorry, their, their content wasn't as good as uh, they thought it was. <clears throat> so with this, um, uh, what do I call it? Like an upside-down pyramid, I think of it like. So you create a pillar piece of content, which is a long-form piece of content, an hour long. Some ideas could be, I mean, if you're doing a talk like this, it's perfect for a pillar piece of content. It's a long-form piece of content. You can do it with interviews. You could do it with um, uh, you, you could do it in front of the camera with a whiteboard. Um, you could record your team meeting. You could interview staff. There's loads of different ways that you can create a, a long form piece of content. And I, if you are in B two B and you want to get it professionally produced because you think your competitors might be doing that, then it's worthwhile doing because I mean an hour with a videographer is not going to cost you a huge amount of investment, but then you just got to get them to edit it into lots of different videos. So you've got your pillar content, and then you use that to create micro content. This is how I create all my stuff. But it's not like I'm posting, it's not like today I'm just gonna create 50 posts and that's all you'll see for the next three months. I've got like five hard drives sitting at home with content I haven't posted yet. So ne never like desperate for content. I find it challenging to do the live stuff like on stories and that. I think my life's that interesting. I admire Brooke for doing that like every day. She's like, oh, here I am. I'm like, I don't even want to do that in public. I feel like a dickhead, like, you know? <laughs> I push myself to do it sometimes. You notice I'm a little bit nervous. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Hope no one sees me. <laughs> and then you distribute it across social media. But this, the, the most important thing is you keep doing it, right? So then you just work out, like, where the audience, what the audience is interested in. And, you, and this becomes your process. Like, this is the way you learn how to get better at social media is you listen to the audience. I mean, I'm sure that you guys are doing this anyway, um, but the quicker you do it, the higher volume of content you put out there, the, the quicker you get feedback, the quicker you'll learn. Because the problem is if you do it too slow, everything's changed by the time you've worked out you know, what your audience wants. And it's just becoming more competitive. It's, it's not going to be long now until the, all the big companies start nailing it on social media. And when I say nailing it, I don't just mean their company page. I mean, they've got like, thousands of their employees in a seminar like this learning how to promote their, their business. I mean, the amount of the potential there is huge. So it's just going to become more competitive for, for uh, smaller businesses. Uh, can we get a microphone down the back there? What's your name? Uh, Becky. Thanks. Becky. Hello. Hey, Becky. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, with the long, long form, would that be distributed via LinkedIn and then the shorter form go on to things like Facebook and Instagram? Great question. So the videos on LinkedIn have to be less than 10 minutes. So what I do with the long form content is I put them on YouTube and my podcast. That's where I put them. Um, so if you ever want to like spend your Saturday night watching me talk, go to YouTube. That's where you find all the long stuff, right? <laughs> But on social media, because people are scrolling, it has to be shorter than that. And I suggest the optimal length for the video on LinkedIn would be like two or three minutes. Thank you. Unless it's an ad, in which case it should be like 30 seconds. Yeah. 
So if you've got, the good thing is, if you've got a piece of content that is long, then you've got the opportunity to chop it up into lots of different pieces of content. If you want to do the video editing yourself, I'll give you a program to use. Wondershare Filmora is what I used when I started. It's very easy to use. Filmora, check it out. It's like, I don't know, 90 bucks or something. And then Adobe Premiere Pro is like the bee's knees, but I've tried, you know, using it. You just spend hours and hours and hours and then export it at the wrong size. Premiere Pro? Oh, Filmora. Wondershare Filmora, F-I-L-M-O-R-A. Yeah, very easy to use. Um, and so like this is an example of that keynote being chopped up in, by um, a video production company. So what I did is I got a company in Sydney and these guys in Perth, and I sat them down and go, okay, this is the process that we're going to use to create social media videos. Okay, and we're going we're to film this, we're going to do three angles so that, you know, we can swap, make it interesting. He here's heaps of stock footage that we could throw in there to make it even more interesting. And every answer, we're going to chop it up into a video. Okay, and then we use the same structure, it's the same thumbnail, just different title for every video. So it's, it's like going to McDonald's and create like the way that they cook cheeseburgers. We're doing the same things with, with videos. <coughs> and uh, planning your content, really, people say, how do you plan your content? I was always like, you just get a calendar, right? <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. You might post a video on Wednesday the 1st, and then you've got an image on Friday. This is actually a, a, one of our clients. And so every month, we will give our clients this. And then on the next worksheet, it has a list of all of the captions and a link to the actual media, or the video or the image we're posting. So they can just approve it all at once. But like these days, the best time to post on LinkedIn by like over, it's about 30 or 40% higher than all the other days is Wednesday. So that's. We always post on Wednesday. 40% is a lot. Huge amount. Huge. Yeah. Well, it's the average, so unless you've got any other data, yeah. It, 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 what it isn't, um, what you've got to think of as well, though, is where your audience is located. So I think it's always a good idea to post in the morning where your audience is because you want to get fast engagement. Like the social media channels are looking at how quickly people will like and comment on your stuff. So if you put something on LinkedIn, this is the way the algorithm works. It's quite simple, really, because it's li LinkedIn's not as evolved as some of the other ones, is they'll look at your content. They'll first of all do a quick scan of it with AI and, and work out whether or not it's spammy content. It's also looking for things like outbound links. It doesn't want people to leave the platform. So if you've got an outbound link, it's not going to get as much reach. Once it's done that, it'll if you've got 100 people that you're connected to, it'll show them to, say, 10. Like It's not the real numbers, but it's, let's say it shows them to a tenth of your network. And then, uh, and then LinkedIn waits to see if anyone likes and comments on it. If they do, if say three people like, on, like it, two people comment, they go, okay, it's valuable, we'll show it to all 100. And then if they get more engagement, then they're like, okay, it's really valuable, we're going to show it to people outside the network that are following the topics that this post is about, that are connected to people that have engaged with it. And so that's how you create viral content. Viral content comes from the word virus, so we all know what that's like, like last year, right? Contagious. So if you make your content engaging, that's how you get more attention. And so it's really important. Like I, I don't think it's necessarily the key to growing a business, but it is really important to get the attention in the first place and make it, and make it engaging enough for people to comment. So you've got to ask some questions, get them to contribute, always be thinking about you know, how, do, how does the audience participate in this. If you want to get quick likes or quick um, uh, comments, how can I how can I get my f post in front of people so they comment on it quicker? Well, one way is you could tag them in it, right? Like, it, but don't go, go home and tag 50 people in your post. It's got to be relevant. But the amount of times I see my clients post about something, they might have a photograph with like Mark Boris or something, and they don't tag him in it. You know, you know they don't tag the other people in the, in the photograph with them. And I'm like, if you tag them, all, of the, all the people in the photograph will get a notification straight away that you've just posted and that they're tagged in it. So what are they going to do? Look at it right away. I, I stumble across uh, photographs all the time of me online that I'm not tagged in. Missed opportunity for them to get engagement, if that's what they want. <coughs> okay, just finally, because we've got to um, move on. 
No, you can go to the bathroom, yeah. I've, I'm going to be a lot longer than I should be. <laughs> so lead generation, there's a three-step process you can use to generate leads on LinkedIn. It's not like Instagram. It's okay to, to private message somebody. If they've accepted your connection request and they're in your network, it's implied consent that you can contact them. It's totally cool, but you've just got to do it in a way that adds value and it's not creepy. You're at a networking function, they're in the room. Just don't go up to them and be a dickhead, that's all. Like, you know, don't go up and try and sell them something. Jesus, I, you should really talk to me because I can get you to the top of Google. Have you heard about all my awards? These are all my clients. Like, come on, the people are not going to respond to that sort of thing. You can't just start pitching people. You have to find out if they have the problem. So you might go up to them and you say, hey, tell me about, a bit about what you do. Where do you get your customers from? What are your plans this year? Do you have a website, one of those things? Oh, yeah, are you happy with it? Where does it rank in the search results? They might tell you that they have a, the problem that you solve. And if they do, then you say, oh, would you like to know how I could help you with that? And if they say yes, you've got permission to pitch to them. That's the, that's the way you use social media. But what I suggest you do is don't have that conversation on social media. Do what Brooke said and bring the conversation offline. But you don't necessarily need a lead magnet to do that because it's a social environment. On LinkedIn, you could private message somebody and say, hey, I've noticed that you're the um, managing director of this dental clinic. I work with loads of dental clinics. I would love to find out more about what your business it does, see if there's any opportunities to work together. What's your phone number? Not everyone's going to respond. So if you send 100 messages, at least 10 will. On, if you cold call somebody, like, it's effective less than 1% of the time. And I'm not talking about making a sale. I mean getting an appointment. You make 100 phone calls, one appointment. And there's loads of people doing it. On LinkedIn, make 100 phone calls, you can get at least 10 appointments. Depends on the industry. I've seen as much as 40 appointments. I'll show you an example in a sec. This guy, um, Dean, he does uh, fit-outs for offices and, and commercial buildings. And, um, you know, he says there that he was... After 30 days, was consistently meeting with two potential clients every day. And um, most effective lead generation system I've come across. Da, 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 da. So th the beauty of it is, because if you have a website, right? When I started LinkedIn marketing, I was working for an online marketing agency. And I said to the boss, because I'd never worked in online marketing, I said, what's the best client that you can get in online marketing? And he's like, well, the best clients that pay the most that are the easiest to deal with are plastic surgeons because they always need new clients. They don't know anything about marketing. And I was like, perfect. That's who I'm targeting in Melbourne. And so I'd make a list of all of the plastic surgeons, all the big ones, and i go and knock on all their doors. i go to like, drive down Chapel Street and like, there's this, there's this thing that surgery clinics have called a practice manager. And their job is to stop people like me speaking to the surgeon. <laughs> and so... It wasn't very successful, and I thought, I'll try calling them. Couldn't get past the practice manager again. I said, these practice managers are really difficult. And it was around about the time I'd started my LinkedIn profile, and there was a photograph of me in a nightclub in Thailand going like this. <laughs> right? And I thought, I wonder if these guys are on here. Because I, I searched surgeon, Melbourne, did a search, and th there was all these profiles. And I thought, well, I'll just send them a connect see what happens, connection request. And so I contacted 10 surgeons, I got six uh, phone calls, four meetings, and one sale. But when I went to the sales meeting in my first month working for this company, and everyone's sharing their sales for the month, it's going around the room and it's a bit like this. Like one guy's got like seven deals and it equates to like $8,000 in revenue. Another guy's got like 12 deals and it equates to $15,000. I was like, I only got one deal, but it was a $25,000 sale. Because it's a, it was an ideal client. That's what the boss said, but they were the best. So when you get leads from like a website, you can't really decide whether it's somebody with a $500 budget or a $30,000 budget. You know they have the need. They're looking for a solution. You know that. But you, don't, you can't really be extremely specific. And so this guy, you know, doing um, office fit-outs and stuff like that, he was getting a lot like lit traffic to his websites, but they, a lot of them weren't relevant. They weren't people he could work with. So as soon as it goes on LinkedIn, it could be extremely targeted, but you don't, know, you don't know if they have the need yet. They're not searching for what you do. That's the difference. So it's extremely targeted, A-grade clients, 
but you've just got to approach them in a way that's higher up the customer journey. So you can ask them the questions to see if they've got the problem you solve. And if they don't have the problem you solve, you just move on, but you won't have ruined the relationship. So they, six months later, they have the need, they'll reach out to you on LinkedIn, they're in your network, they'll see your content, boom. These are the statistics for uh, this particular case study. And I got loads of these, I just wanted to show you one today, because I think that if you're gonna do anything to generate leads immediately, it's the fastest way to do it, it's through connecting and messaging people. So they, uh, we sent 241 requests, invitations out. Team do 50 to 100 connection requests an hour. So it seems like a lot, but you get quite quick at it. And these are customized with their name and everything. So out of those 241, 183 people said, yes, I'll accept the invitation. So you got 75% conversion rate from invitation to new connection. And then they all got the follow-up message. So the connection request, all, all it says is, you know, I've seen we've got some mutual connections. Would you like to connect? 75% of people say yes. Those 183 people that are now part of this client's network, we message them and say, hey, I'm noticing you're in this industry. You know, I work with businesses that are similar to yours. Um, I'd like to find out more about what you do. What's your phone number? So 183 messages, 75 leads, 41% of people said, yeah, sure, let's hop on a phone call. And so when he gets on that phone call, all he's doing is saying, so the purpose of this call is to me to find out a little bit more about your business to see if there's an opportunity for us to work together or not. Is that okay? And the guy's like, okay, yeah, sure. And so all he's doing is just asking the questions that will uncover whether or not there's a need there. And if there is a need, he said, he asked for permission, permission to pitch to him. So he says, would you like to know, would you like to know how I can help you with that? If you, if you do it like that, you won't piss anyone off. People will say no at some time. Sometimes, sometimes people will say, no, I don't want to have a phone call. You say, okay, thank you. You haven't pissed anyone off. You get on the phone call. Would you like to know more about how I can help you with that? No, thank you. Okay, have a good day. So th the reason that you don't want to piss people off is so that if they have the need later, that they, they, they'll contact you, whereas if you've pitched to them, they won't want, they'll want to stay way clear of you. They'll rather speak to somebody that they haven't met on Google because they don't want to be sold to. No one wants to be sold to. Everybody wants to buy. No one wants to be sold to. So you've got to help people buy and not try and sell to them. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, awesome. So when you do a search on LinkedIn, there's a little button next to the search bar that says Advanced. And so when you click on Advanced, it gives you all these different fields that you can put keywords into. So like if you just type in a keyword like Instagram coach or something into the, um, the, the top search bar, it'll, it'll crawl their whole profile looking for that keyword. But if you open up advanced and you can put, oh, it's actually, you've got to scroll down, on oh, no, a title, there it is, title. You can put in the job title. So that will only look at one section of their profile, their job title. So if you want them to be managing director, CEO, HR manager, whatever it may be, you want to put it in there so it specifically looks in that section of their profile. Then you select their industry, location, and so all of a sudden you'd like, you've got all these granular like, search criteria that you're looking for businesses with. That's why it's so powerful because if you're in business to business, there's always a decision maker. And sometimes there's more than one. But you can find out exactly who they are um, using the search criteria. And you can't do that on any other platform. And then you can invite them to connect. Because is it fair to say on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, you can't decide who follows you, can you? Like you can do, you can do ads and stuff and you can tell people to follow you, but like whoever follows you, follows you. Whereas on, uh, on LinkedIn, you send someone an invitation to follow you, an invitation to connect. So like you can decide who's in your network. As soon as they connect with you, they'll see your content. So it's a huge opportunity to create this targeted um, network. And like, if you think about it offline, if somebody follows you home from work, it's a bit weird, isn't it? <laughs> but if you get an invitation to an event in your mailbox, it's kind of nice, isn't it? <laughs> I just made that up then. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm not going to pitch to you guys today. Um, I appreciate all of your... Um, you're coming here and investing in yourself. I think, um, you know, I really admire that. And I, if any of you are struggling in your business uh, at the moment, I want you to know that uh, everyone that's successful in business has been exactly where you are. Brooke and I both started with no money. Like, I started with, like, $20,000 worth of debt. And we've been through a lot of the struggles that come with growing a business, and you probably won't hear a lot about it on social media because we don't post during those times. 
but you're not alone. It may seem like you are, if a lot of your friends work for other people and stuff, but we've all been there, and that's why I really admire entrepreneurs, because I know what you have to go through. Well done. If you want a free review of your LinkedIn profile, this is the link that you need to go to. I guess it's probably easiest just to take a photograph of it. That's a link directly to my personal calendar, and if you book in a 30-minute spot, I'll hop on a call with you and review your LinkedIn profile for you for free and give you some advice. Could be. Depends if you have the problem I solve. <laughs> <laughs> Add that slide in. <laughs> well, I thought, I thought to myself, I don't want to sell to this audience. I've invested to be here, but I do want to give them something of value. And I thought, what's the most valuable thing I could provide? And I, I think giving a review of your LinkedIn profile would be... So there you go. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brooke, come on up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the king dear. of New York and the king of LinkedIn. Oh, dear. Well.